Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, hi, Anna. Thank you so much for uh, accepting my invitation to have this very short interview. Uh, uh, the interview is on the topic of the unknown because it's a very, very timely topic and it's a very personal topic for, mem for many members of the community. Um, it's also a topic um, uh, that I've hosted a salon on in January and also now in December. Um, because I'm also going through a lot of changes. And um, I was thinking about you and uh, interviewing you uh, for- Thank you so much. I, maybe I'm the, uh, I'm, the, I'm the expert on the unknown in that I really, <laughs> I'm familiar with the unknown, not that I know what's going to happen. <laughs> and I'm very, very excited uh, to hear your answers regarding this. I'm also writing an essay for the II. So um, this will also help me in uh, gaining a bit more clarity on, on how, to, um, how to write the essay. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, the first question is, and it, it's very, you know, going inside the topic right away. Can we enjoy uncertainty? Wow, that's, that's the big question, right? That everybody's trying to answer from marriage counselors to uh, uh, climbing instructors. Um, I think every person probably has a kind of Goldilocks zone of the amount of uncertainty they want and that they can tolerate. Um, and it can vastly differ, right? I mean, there are these tests, uh, uh, you know, um, researchers looking at toddlers and there seems to be a radius for a child Kind of genetically determined but also a lot of like parenting um you know things uh, uh, play a role um just the radius of like how far the child is okay wandering away from the mother um and it's kind of your exploration exploitation um um you know preference as a person um so i would say that yes we do need some uncertainty um otherwise nobody would watch Netflix series, horror movies, nobody would read books, nobody would have a conversation with a friend who calls you up and says, you're not going to believe what happens, right? I mean, if we could not tolerate any uncertainty, we would just like freak out, hang up on our friend and never talk to them again, right? Um, and I think my, my theory and, you know, probably somebody with a psychology degree would um, have more, um, yeah, more data on this, but I do think that how much uncertainty you can tolerate can greatly be, you know, manipulated, trained. People can open themselves up to be able to accept or or enjoy more uncertainty. Um, but how much you can do without? I don't think so. I don't think people can be really trained to enjoy being bored. <laughs> I think when when we try to, you know, yeah, how to say, uh, when we try to, um, you know, condition people to maybe be okay with a more settled lifestyle what we do is we try to give them other things to do we are like children right like oh we're out of paper and you can't draw oh little johnny here is a little car right uh we try to like give people other things to do and this is what we do with our brains when we don't have the amount of uncertainty that we require we put something else into our brains um visa and i are great community mentor and host uh, visa kanwar um also has a we had, we had this conversation on how like every single person has a daily amount of units of info or bits of information that they need to put into their brain and they will get it. It's like your calorie needs, but it differs. Like calorie needs are quite set across, um, you know, vast variety of people with similar uh, characteristics, but information intake can vary greatly. And that's why some people have extremely loud and extroverted friends because they bring you all those uh, all those pieces of information and other people require to be calmed down by others or books or music um so i don't know that if that answers your question i think yes we can enjoy the unknown i think it greatly depends on the person how how much unknown we're okay enjoying um but that can also be uh you know tweaked trained um conditioned um, and I think, I would say probably most people, almost every single person could do uh, with being a little bit more okay with more uncertainty. Not too much because then people would just like run around naked in the street and do all sorts of weird things and society would collapse, but like a little bit. <laughs> I think that would do us good. I love that you focused on the fact that we need to train ourselves to have more uncertainty, because um, actually in this essay that I'm writing right now, I'm, I'm thinking about 
um, how can we you know shift from the anxiety that we feel in relation to the unknown and have more excitement and there is actually a paper written on this uh, um, by, by a psychologist and she says that just by si just by saying that I am excited before a challenge uh, you are basically in a way training yourself to be excited and you're not so you know overwhelmed by um, anxiety so this is really fascinating um, uh, I wrote here a question about the importance of courage in enjoying the unknown. How important is courage um, or just showing up? And if this showing up is already a form of courage? Oh, I don't know too much about courage. Yeah. These are three I, questions, by the way. So <laughs> I, lo I love it. I don't, I don't think I know too much about courage. I think it's such a, an elusive concept to me. I think I'm quite kind of cocky. Like sometimes I'm like, I'm going to show up. And then, but it's, it's not really like an ongoing thing. Um, whenever I see courage, I always suspect something else is going on. It's a little bit like anger, right? When somebody's angry, nerd writer has this incredible video uh, on the acting of Jack Nicholson. He's kind of like dissecting the character of, uh, the story, the career of, of Jack Nicholson and, and shows how well he plays anger. And he plays anger so well because he understands that anger is never anger. It's always a stand-in for something else. Desperation, fear, surprise, annoyance, physical discomfort um, that kind of comes out as anger. Um, and I have similar, um, you know, suspicions when I see a lot of courage. And maybe the only courage that I, I, I see as, as, as pure courage is altruism driven on the spot first responder courage. So I, I recently went for the first time to the 9-11 Museum in New York City. And, you know, it's an incredibly moving memorial um, with, a lot of accounts of people who just like go into a tower that everybody's fleeing and you go and you save people until you die. I think that's that that to me is courage. Um, when I look at you know other the humanitarians on Tinder, do you know this Tumblr? There's the humanitarians on Tinder, uh, people who are trying to um, you know hit on other people with their um, charity work photos and stuff like that. I think that's honest. I think that's. Uh, that there's always some kind of secondary um, motivation between what seems like courage. Um, it can be, you know, because maybe it's easier to solve than your own problems or you want to see the world, you want to, you know, feel better about yourself. I definitely do it most of the time. So when I'm, you know, courageous, I just want to feel better about myself. <laughs> um, and in, in a small subset of cases, it's because I am really truly disturbed by some kind of injustice and I feel like I need to step up against it. Um, I recently read this um, tweet um, by a friend of mine quoting somebody, I forget whom, um, that um, courage is always a fear of some kind. It's a fleeing off from something, mostly some kind of tyranny, right? And courage is always something that manifests as being for something, but in reality, I think it's against something or rejecting something else. Um, so I always look at what is the thing that this person is rejecting? Um, because to me, it becomes a more interesting feeling. And, and I, I, I'm also more motivated by a complex courage because if somebody just looks like a saint, where well, I'm not a saint, like there's no way I can relate to that or become that. But if there is a, this is why we love antiheroes. If there is a complicated person with complicated courage, uh, I'm like, oh, I have complicated courage. I can do this. Um, this is how I think, you know, the big startup founders in the world get their following, right? It's like, you know that they are imperfect. You know that they are doing something really difficult and probably courageous, but they also have a lot of other problems and, you know, it's ups and downs and, People are like, I have ups and downs. I can do that. Um, so I always say, okay, if you if you if you want to, you know, showcase your own courage, make sure it's relatable and own up to the complexities. That's fascinating, and it's also very much related to showing up. So basically, showing up even you know when you're not at your best, even if you're afraid or very shy or you know a big introvert. Um, I think that's that's so important. And 
in the salon I hosted in January, we uh, we tried to envision, you know, this year, uh, and you know uh, all the unknown that will appear. And of course, I think you know you can only do so much by visualizing it because life is unpredictable. Um, and in the salon now in December, basically, I will ask the participants to look back, you know, um, onto this year, and try to see what unknowns were very unknown. I mean, what they couldn't predict even in their wildest dreams. And my question for you is, how do you think you navigated the unknowns this year? This is fascinating. So for me, my biggest unknowns were two things that were mostly outside my um my kind of area of control, one was the vaccinations and the other was uh, the opening of Schengen so I can go to the US. And I think January 2020, I was at a very, very low moment personally. Um, it was maybe 11 months since I had started um, the online community version of Interinteract. Um, we had a very, very tough lockdown. I was in Brussels, I was stuck in Brussels. Uh, where I'm a completely new person living here. I don't know too many people. Um, it's a cold city, so you can't really go out in the winter. Um, everything was closed from restaurants to hotels. It's not like, oh, I'm bored. I'm going to go to a spa in the countryside. Like, no, there was no spa. Like, this is a pandemic, right? Like, you don't go into a sauna with a bunch of people. Um, and it seemed, it, it almost felt like an external depression or an external trauma, right? In trauma and depression, you have these concepts of like, there's no sense of the future. You feel like it's really repetitive and it's how it is today is going to be like how it is forever, right? And you need cognitive behavioral therapy and other uh, you know, uh, therapeutic methods to, to help people get out from this mindset that no, you may have a terrible day today, but tomorrow is another day and you will be a kind of a different person tomorrow and that's fine and probably it's going to be better. Um, and I felt like it, it was almost like a collective externally imposed depression where it, when it felt like, oh, this is going to be like this forever. Like we will never get vaccinated. Like these, the governments are incompetent. You know, we, we are terrible at this and, 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 and people were trying to deal with these feelings. Um, and for me, the, 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 the known element in this was interintellect and my friends and, the people who need me in life, right? And, and I knew that, you know, in many ways our job at Interintellect is to be a, a, a kind of haven in this crazy world for people. And then you know that it's always there and you can go and come back and, and your friends are here and your co-thinkers are here, your collaborators are here, your crush is here, your future boss is here. you like all the people that you wanna hang out with are here and, and, and for me, I was really lucky because this externally imposed depression had a, a quite good um, internally created foundation or baseline for me, which was like, you know, this is uh, my work is really, um, you know, it, it matters to a lot of people or, or our, our you know, results. Um, but that said, I had no idea. I was like, maybe I would spend the entire 2021 stuck in Brussels again. And, you know, years go by um, and, and then I don't know something, I think I, I was a bit like, let's control the parts that I can control. Um, and I turned into a hyper Londoner, uh, super competitive. <laughs> um, seven years of London did not pass without um, some kind of effect on me. And I somehow like got into a relatively early cohort uh, for vaccinations here. Um, and I got my, I mean, felt really early, like for Europe. Like America had already been vaccinated long before. Um, and that enabled me to start traveling in July, um, which kind of turned the unknown I dislike, which is sitting on my bum in my apartment waiting for a government to do something, which sounds like a terrible thing, <laughs> to the unknown I do like, which is, oh, I'm going to go to this new place uh, where I've never been. And there will be new people. I'm going to meet, I, I, I was about to meet people that I had never met in person before. Um, and those are the kind of motivating, um, uh, you know, motivating uh, unknowns. And I think the, the difference, the, the great difference is not the internal, external, but 
your levels of confidence at being able to handle the uh, the un like the the unexpected events right if it's an externally imposed unknown which render, renders you out of control you're also not sure whether you would be able to handle it like i was i don't know about you but i was sitting here in february 2020 or 2021 sorry 2021 uh, early this year right and i thought um you know, if if I have to do one more year of this, maybe I won't be able to take it. And that's what everybody was thinking, like people who had their two children at home jumping around their head were also like, I'm not sure I can do this for one more year. Um, whereas the unexpected things that can happen during like traveling, you can kind of prepare for those, right? Like you have a, have insurance and you remember your flight details and you fill out your passenger locator and like you you do things and and you have this self-confidence that probably most of the uh, statis the statistically likely unknowns you will be able to handle um and to me that's that's probably the biggest difference between the two unknowns but definitely 2021 was like shifting from one the early 2021 um kind of externally exposed depression to internally exposed openness. Uh, how, how was it for you? It was quite a year, <laughs> honestly. I think we will need like a two hours uh, interview only for that. Um, so you can write your uh, book, finally. Exactly, exactly. So it was as well a very intense year also for me. But as you said, this motivating unknowns were so, so important and so much to look forward to. Because without them, I think uh, it would have been a very, very tough year. And um, uh, also for me, this community gave me somehow of, well, some kind of an anchor. And, you know, like this kind of a intimate group where I can, you know, um, ask questions, be myself, uh, <laughs> um, seek support. That was also very, very important in, in knowing that I can always ask for help in this kind of a year with so many unknowns. And, and my last question for you, because I want to keep this interview short and sweet, is um, actually for the community. What would you advise a person that is facing at the moment many unknowns? And not only for the community, also for our Twitter friends and the strangers watching. Uh, what advice would you give them? Um, especially as we know that now a lot of people are again changing jobs changing countries starting their own businesses embarking em embarking on new projects hmm. i mean i would probably be reluctant to give a generic advice because what kind of unknown is this right is somebody waiting for the results of their cancer screening are they considering quitting their job um are they about to move in with their lover? <laughs> you know, these are very different kinds of unknowns. Um, I really, I really believe in a combination of uh, building a support network where you can talk about things um, and who also hold you accountable, um, so you don't give up during the, the process of dealing with the unknown because it's really easy to say like, oh, this is too hard. I'm just like off um and and this balance of like having the support circle but also taking time to just listen to your inner voice at least for me i for me my best decisions come from this dialogue between or or this kind of interaction between the voices of the people that i trust most who often disagree with each other, right? So it's not like, oh, I have like a Greek choir who sometimes like shows up and says, this is what I should do. And they all get it, no. Um, and, and then I kind of like retreat and digest and, and, and process what they've said and kind of know which, or maybe it's, maybe it's none of them, right? Maybe like they just like inspire me to come up with my own answer. Um, that's, that's how I would do it. I do, I really believe in, you know, whatever form of introspection works for you, praying, meditating, using I Ching or other kind of meditation prompts, um, you know, um, just taking quiet walks, having deep conversations with your closest friends or just going into therapy. Um, because 
in, in a weird way, you need to hear how you change during an uncertain period of time. Um, of course, during meditation, you don't really hear it. You are just like observing your thoughts. Um, but create something that visualizes the timeline for you. Maybe it's journaling, actually. Like maybe that's the most visual version. Um, because what you want to um, what you what you want to create for people, I think, during uncertain times is is the sense that you are moving forward, that there is a road and that there's time and there's change. So it's neither you know, hard work, but it doesn't pay off, neither um, nor um, you know, um, there's no time, uh, but it's also not, um, you know, oh, it's, uh, it's just like fleeting moments that don't add up. Like what you need is to understand that you know, your life is an, has a narrative. Um, even if there are competing storylines and some are very uncomfortable, uh, incompatible, um, you will, it probably kind of coalesces into, you know, some kind of narrative, right? At least there's like a, a main narrative in our lives. Um, and, and for people to understand that even in the most unknown periods, you're working on this main narrative. And it has a, you know, there is causality and there is time and, and it is going somewhere. Um, so for me, that's that's really important to kind of communicate to people when they're going through something. That's fascinating. And in this way, also people will not be overwhelmed by so much unknown. And it's actually also something that um, I'm doing with visualizing it in the sense that I'm usually just drawing a line 10 years in the past, 10 years into the future. And as you said, this is a narrative so and in this way i'm also celebrating all the years that you know uh, are you know now in the past and all the um, you know achievements i had and it also gives me a bit of enthusiasm for the next 10 years <laughs> i think it's going to be a lot of fun and i think what what happened during the pandemic and this was kind of marvelous to observe in the community as well is that people are so much bigger than they think like people are vast landscapes of stuff right and we're suddenly, you know, facing this stress and this time on our hands and all these things that we were, did not want to do. And I think people were kind of bulged a little bit out into this landscape. And they were like, oh, oh my God, like, is this all me? Yes. Um, and you can, you know, you don't have to inhabit the entire landscape all the time. It would be pretty tiring, right? People like to like set up camp somewhere and say like, this is the hill that I like most. This is where I'm going to have my main narrative cooking. Um, but, but knowing it's there and knowing how deeply we can actually change. We can't really change our like daily habits. I think that's, that's harder. That's James Clear star tree. Like it's easier to change religions than change your eating habits <laughs> somehow <laughs> or, or put down smoking. Um, but, um, but the, the framework in which we explore reality can be changed. And that's fascinating. It's actually a fascinating thing about people that you can, you know, that you can change the big things more easily than the small things. You know how, it's in many ways, it's easier to get a divorce and start with, start anew with a new relationship than it is to, I don't know, change which, which is your favorite spot on the couch in your house. Um, and that, that's, that's amazing. Maybe this is why people are drawn to intern tech because we kind of like probe these big questions and, and they, are, they are the things where we can actually make the most progress. So I, uh, I really encourage everybody to explore the landscape a little bit more. This reminds me of a quote by Rebecca Solnit that we hardly know our depths. And I think in a way we are our biggest unknown. Um, yeah, and with that, I think I will, <laughs> I will end now the interview. Thank you. So, Beautiful so place to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so so much. I'll go back now to my writing. This uh, this gave me more uh, inspiration for for writing the essay. Thank you so much. I can't wait to read it. Um, and thank you everybody who watched uh, and sent us your questions or comments. Take care. Bye.